All right, so this, uh, this talk began uh, with asking two questions. <laughs> uh, first, why have we failed so spectacularly um, at finding uh, treatments in medicine for the most common diseases that we see? And the second question is, why do we continue to repeat that mistake over and over and over uh, despite uh, that failure? I'll give you just another second to appreciate this. <laughs> All right, so um, one of the uh, reasons that I directed my, decided to direct my interest in the neurosciences into a career in neurology was because I thought uh, that we were on the verge of some major breakthroughs in a lot of the uh, most common diseases that we faced, and as were many other people. Um, so I was led to believe that as well, and uh, that was a bit of a mistake. Um, so if you look at this... Uh, timeline here. These are the sort of major breakthroughs, pharmaceutical breakthroughs that have been made in some of the major categories of neurological disease. And um, the, um, uh, so the mark is essentially for the last significant breakthrough that was not perhaps clinically uh, considered a breakthrough, but at least a stepwise change from what we'd had previously. Um, so if we look to this, the last one would have been was uh, migraine in uh, 1991 with the drug sumatriptan, a drug taken for migraine relief. Um, and it's debatable, even with that one, whether uh, that it's been a net benefit or done more harm than good. So if we were to throw that one out, we have to go all the way back to 1961 uh, with levodopa for Parkinson's disease. Um, so to say that this uh, lack of progress is surprising is, is an understatement. So there we have the therapeutic winter, winter between 1961 and, and 2019 to illustrate um, a lack of progress. And, and notable things absent from here, uh, things like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, diabetic neuropathy, other common things that we neurologists see. And this isn't limited to neurology, so these are some of the major categories of disease in other areas. Um, and if we look uh, here, you know, we see uh, 1970 uh, Prozac for depression being sort of the last landmark. Um, that's not to say there aren't new drugs being developed, but nothing that's been a stepwise change from anything that preceded it. So Santa Claus has gotten in on the fun in the therapeutic winter. Um, so the, uh, as I said, I, I, one of the reasons that I decided to pursue a career in neurology was because I thought we were going to have some major breakthroughs within that period of time. And I still uh, vividly remember as a senior in medical school asking one of the prominent Alzheimer's researchers at my institution when he thought we might have a cure, a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And his estimation was 10 years. And um, that was the year 2000. And we haven't, we've sent, we have made zero progress um, on the pharmaceutical front. And some of you may have seen headlines like these that um, the pharmaceutical industry is giving up a search for an Alzheimer's cure um, because it's so uh, futile and has uh, spent billions of dollars on that project. So if we might have to revise uh, my, uh, the, the, our projection of when we might find that breakthrough from, if we consider that it was uh, first d d reported in 1906, Alzheimer's disease by Alois Alzheimer's, um, and maybe you could argue that the current drugs are a, are a minor uh, progress. Um, we've made a tiny little step forward, but maybe uh, our, our realistic projection is in the next 2,000 years or so. So um, I think, you know, anyone taking a sober look at this, um, you know, it has to ask themselves the question, what the flock is going on? Um, which brings me to Angry Birds. Um, so this, uh, the parable of the uh, Angry Birds is a thought experiment to help try to answer our first question. Um, and uh, so imagine that uh, an iPhone lands on an alien planet and uh, 
these aliens, they don't, had never seen iPhones, they don't have any computers, they don't play any games where you launch birds at pigs' forts. Um, but they are uh, a curious and competitive uh, species of aliens, so uh, they're intrigued and they decide they're going to have a uh, competition. And so they're going to meet back, they're going to break into two teams, meet back in a month, and to see which team is better and, and crown one team the uh, victor. So one team goes off and uh, does what most of us would probably do, which is to play the game over and over again um, and try to get really good at it. Um, so they, uh, and, and so that's their approach. The other team, uh, they have a few scientists in their midst, so they start taking the game apart and they realize that there's these, um, that the game itself is just an illusion um, and that underneath it, sort of specifying everything about the game is this, co is, is this um, programming language and underneath that is machine language and that really it's all just uh, transistors in the momentary, uh, their momentary state uh, and all, all just uh, at the root ones and zeros. So they decide that uh, they're, they're super excited by the way. They think that they've you know, cracked the code and so the other team's gonna have no chance. And uh, their goal is going to be to uh, to manipulate the source code uh, as, as their approach to winning the game. So once again, team game level, we're gonna figure out how the game works, learn the controls, learn the game mechanics, get really good at that part. Team source code is going to uh, try to manipulate the source code in real time and win the game that way. So game day arrives. And the team game level crushes it, right? They, they uh, post a super high score and uh, team source code's turn comes up and it's a massacre. They can't even get the game to run once without it crashing. Um, and that's because um, even the person or people who coded the game could not do such a thing. Um, there's no computer scientist alive who could look at the machine language of any piece of software and have any idea what it did. Um, so they are doomed to fail. So we are uh, here because we think that an evolutionary perspective uh, is essential to understanding the foundations of health and we also believe that mismatches between our ancestral and modern environment uh, drive the pathogenesis of chronic diseases. And what this parable hopefully illustrates is that um, our failure to translate uh, immense progress in science and technology into any therapeutic progress um, comes from the absence of an evolutionary perspective in our approach to therapeutics. So modern medicine has almost exclusively taken um, team source codes approach to finding new therapies. And um, another way of thinking about source code interventions is that they are evolutionarily novel um, and so mismatched as well to our uh, physiology. And so by adopting evolutionarily novel types of treatments, um, we're essentially introducing all the same hazards and risks um, that led to the conditions that we're trying to treat in the first place. And I would argue that that uh, approach of favoring source code interventions over game level interventions explains our therapeutic winter. On the other hand, uh, the ancestral health therapeutic paradigm would be, is to take team game levels approach. So um, this is how we would integrate an evolutionary perspective into how we evaluate and develop um, therapies. So. Uh, unlike source code interventions, game level interventions are evolutionarily familiar and so matched to our evolutionary history. And so I think if we can fully embrace uh, this paradigm, then we have the opportunity to leverage all of the advances that we have made in uh, science and technology uh, so that medical therapeutics can catch up with all of the other areas of human progress. And so because it's um, 
I think, a very useful frame for understanding uh, what an ancestral health perspective on therapy looks like. Um, let's explore this distinction between game level and source code interventions a little bit more. So, as I mentioned, one way to think about a game level intervention is that it's evolutionarily familiar. So, um, these are the evolutionary forces which we've been um, adapting to throughout the history of our species um, and beyond. And really, the sum total of actions that we might take in the game of life, whereas um, source code interventions are, by their nature, evolutionarily novel. So from a safety perspective, um, game level interventions are safer because they engage evolved regulatory mechanisms, um, whereas source code interventions are going to be inherently riskier because they bypass those evolved regulatory mechanisms so, and so are much more likely to crash the system. <clears throat> uh, game level interventions are also more uh, powerful because they act upstream um, in the physiologic cascade, so impacting many pathways, whereas uh, source code interventions are inherently weaker because they act downstream and with a narrower scope of influence. Game level interventions are also better suited towards intervening in a complex adaptive system where uh, the outcome of a source code intervention can't be predicted. And uh, the uh, source code interventions are most appropriate for complicated systems or scenarios where we know uh, a condition is caused by a single factor and where we need a targeted uh, intervention. And it's no coincidence that um, pretty much all of the most significant breakthroughs in medicine come from that sort of uh, condition where we have a single, single target like a uh, meningi meningococcus causing meningitis, for example, um, where all the major breakthroughs have been made. So just to review, uh, evolution, or, uh, game level interventions are evolutionarily familiar. They engage evolved regulatory mechanisms and so are inherently safer. They have an upstream locus of action and so have they're stronger, not stronger. <laughs> and they're best suited for intervening in uh, complex adaptive systems, whereas source code interventions are evolutionarily novel. Um, they bypass evolved regulatory me mechanisms and so are inherently riskier. They have a downstream locus of action and that, uh, as such are inherently weaker and are best suited for intervening in complicated systems where the uh, impact of the intervention can be predicted. <clears throat> So some of the implications that fall out from this. Um, randomized controlled trials are the appropriate way to acquire knowledge about source code interventions. So uh, where you have, where you're going to be uh, manipulating a single variable and you have a static intervention that's not going to change. Now, it's reasonable to think um, given sort of the complexity of biological systems, uh, if we should ever expect a breakthrough uh, when that is our primary therapeutic paradigm, um, uh, impacting a single variable with a static intervention. So uh, you could argue that we've sab sabotaged ourselves from the outset by requiring that as the only means of validating uh, new ther ther therapeutic knowledge. And uh, by the same token, randomized controlled trials are the wrong way to acquire knowledge about game level interventions where you're going to be manipulating multiple variables and that, that uh, manipulation is going to be dynamic. So if you think about a baseball player trying to learn how to throw a curveball, um, you know, it, it would be a bit ludicrous to consider uh, manipulating one variable at a time, uh, especially considering that you change one thing, it's almost certain that you're going to need to change another uh, to accommodate it. So it would be needlessly uh, tedious and time consuming and unlikely to ever arrive at the uh, optimal solution. But one of the most common objections that we would hear to, um, uh, to, to those of us who advocate an ancestral health paradigm or ancestral approach to, to therapies is that we need more trials. And I would um, 
argue that it's not, and by that they mean more randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, I would argue that's not what we need. We do need research, but we need to develop an entirely new research ecosystem that's designed towards developing uh, game level knowledge. Um, so this is how you, how we acquire game level knowledge. We play the game, we make some action, we assess uh, what happens, we get feedback, we refine our approach, and then we uh, try again. So it is an iter iterative trial and error uh, process, and most of the knowledge that we all have in our heads was acquired in this manner, um, including a lot of the knowledge that we know about human health. So we have no randomized controlled trial uh, telling us that uh, humans need water to stay alive or that they need to breathe or that decapitation leads to a permanent loss of consciousness. <laughs> Yet we all consider these things as incontrovertible truths. Um, and uh, to, if someone would argue that all we have is anecdotal evidence, we would think that's absurd. Another important implication here is that um, mechanistic understanding isn't required to win the game. Um, so, if, again, if I'm a baseball player trying to learn to throw a curveball, I don't need to know anything about the underlying physics uh, to do that well. I only need to know about what, what, uh, about, uh, what I need to do at the game level. Um, and furthermore, somewhat counterintuitively, even knowing the underlying physics doesn't typically help me throw that curveball any better. Um, by the same token, uh, we knew that air uh, and water uh, and uh, were essential to life, and decapitation was not, uh, l long before we knew the mechanisms involved at why we need water or why we need, uh, why we need to breathe, we, long before we knew about oxygen and the electron transport chain. Um, and yet, uh, in spite of that, we, uh, the, if we can't provide mechanistic explanations for something that we do, it's considered undermining uh, that intervention and often another, another common objection to someone who would advocate for a game level uh, intervention. And of course, that particular objection comes from the paradigm itself, which says that we should be looking at the mechanisms first to guide our pursuit of a therapeutic intervention, which is the very paradigm that has led to our therapeutic winter. So we have kind of two forms of knowledge here, right, that we can uh, develop, one being mechanistic understanding and one being simply research at how to play the game. And these are both valuable forms of knowledge. Uh, they just have different um, forms, uh, ways of application. Um, and if we want to get better at uh, helping our patients at, at, at uh, developing new and transformative therapies, and we should be redistributing this uh, allocation of resources uh, significantly. Um, imagine if we had have been pouring the same amount of effort into developing uh, research on how to play the game uh, as we have in advancing mechanistic knowledge. So let's uh, now revisit are the two questions that I started with. Um, so the first was, why have we uh, failed so spectacular to, spectacularly in finding uh, new treatments? And the second being, why have we continued to repeat uh, that same mistake or that same approach in spite, in, in spite of overwhelming evidence that it's not working? And um, I think it's, uh, uh, important, or I think one of the, uh, potential explanations here. One, one explanation is that we all find um, reductionism inherently seductive. So because it's a product of science and reason and because it reveals to us uh, levels of explanation that are initially hidden, um, it feels as if we've uncovered some deeper truth uh, and it feels like we have, have uh, found the man behind the curtain and it's sort of everything else is just an illusion. Um, so, and I think we're all biased towards uh, thinking that's a uh, more privileged uh, form of knowledge. And 
hopefully I've illustrated that um, that's not the case, that, that different kinds of knowledge have different domains of application. Um, but I think we're all, again, biased in this direction and into thinking that reductionist uh, knowledge is inherently superior. And again, I'm not, complaining, uh, not claiming that it doesn't have a role, uh, even in therapeutics, but I would say um, that by uh, not factoring this into account, we're missing out on a uh, tremendous opportunity to, to uh, usher in a revolution in, in therapeutics. And because we are all prone to this bias, or most of us are prone to this bias, I know I am, um, it's helpful to have safeguards in place uh, to kind of um, keep us from being lured by the seduction of uh, reductionism. And so I think it's helpful to kind of formalize what an ancestral approach to therapeutics looks like, uh, what incorporating an uh, evolutionary perspective uh, looks like, so that we can also have a common language for talking about it and a compass to help orient ourselves and uh, keep, a, keep us focused on what we consider to be uh, most important. So to that end, um, I'll now present a um, four quadrant model that uh, kind of formalizes how I think about uh, an ancestral approach uh, to uh, interventions and, and my own personal way of safeguarding myself against the reductionist trap. So on the vertical axis, we have the uh, level of the intervention. So uh, again, we have game level interventions and uh, we have source code interventions. So uh, game level interventions, once again, are ones that act at the level of evolutionary forces, kind of the topmost level of biology. Uh, whereas source code, level, uh, source code interventions generally act at the level of cells. So, you know, things that have impact enzymes, neurotransmitters, receptors, and so on. Um, and then on the horizontal axis, we would have things that uh, are supportive, meaning we're trying to support whatever the body is trying to do at any given moment. Um, and generally speaking, we're, it, it, from an evolutionary standpoint, what we're trying to do there uh, typically is to minimize mismatch between our ancestral and modern environment. And then uh, the other category in terms of the goal of our intervention would be things that are disruptive or exploitative. So where we are uh, essentially uh, taking the uh, physiologic st status quo and overriding it in some way. We're redi redirecting, redirecting it because we think that doing so has some sort of benefit. So why would you um, do such a thing? Probably the, the main case would be when you have a regulatory system that you think is broken beyond repair. Uh, so an example being um, giving insulin to someone with type 1 diabetes. Uh, so they can't, they can't manufacture it anymore. That's their physiologic status quo. So you administer it uh, because the system is broken. Um, exploitative uh, interventions would be uh, where we are taking our understanding of physiology and doing something that exploits it in some way. Uh, so, for example, um, we can take our understanding of what happens to the body in temperature extremes, uh, whether it's heat or cold, and uh, use that to uh, improve health in some way. Um, or uh, that, would be, that would be a game level uh, intervention, whereas a source code might be um, to give a vaccine uh, so that we can uh, help our immune system uh, fight off a pathogen uh, in the future. So again, we're exploiting some knowledge of biology. And you see those? so here are just a few uh, more examples of what those would be. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but just to kind of help illustrate um, what I'm talking about here. Um, so all the things in that uh, top left category are the things that we talk about most at these kinds of conferences. Um, and then some of the uh, exploitative type things, like I mentioned, we'd have heat and cold exposures, uh, breathing methods, um, fasting, um, high intensity training, mindfulness, psychotherapy, again, all things that take our understanding of uh, what we know about biology and are intervening at the game level to uh, confer some benefit. And then source code interventions that would be supportive, uh, mainly the, the, the main thing I think about here are where we, where we uh, think that there's a nutrient or that's uh, insufficient 
and the body needs more of to do its job. So we're trying to support its ability to do what it needs to do. And then source code interventions that are disruptive would essentially be all pharmaceuticals, uh, things like nootropics, and then um, hyper supplementation. So you're, where you're supplementing with something past the point of uh, correcting a, def a deficiency. And so uh, the decision algorithm from an ancestral point of view uh, would be to prioritize uh, category one, which would essentially be the foundations of health, um, over, over uh, intervention two, and then three and four, um, unless you had uh, had to have evidence that would indicate uh, otherwise, that you should prioritize one over another. So, which there, you know, that, that can't exist. So um, another reason why I think that we've uh, continued to repeat this same mis mistake over and over again is that we uh, need solutions that scale and uh, diet uh, and, I mean, not diet, but drugs and supplements um, scale really well. And another problem is that the way we currently, uh, or our current regulatory system for evaluating new drugs uh, allows companies to make or to create a blockbuster drug, uh, even if it's no better than its predecessors. And that's been the prevailing strategy for the last few decades. Um, I think we're, they're starting to squeeze the last drops out of that particular strategy, but it has prevented market voice forces from forcing their hand into looking for something that's truly um, a breakthrough or truly an improvement upon what currently exists. Um, and. I feel quite certain that there are people who are in the drug research industry who've recognized this and know that um, we that true breakthroughs will require a paradigm shift, uh, but realize that the only route to profitability is to create these Me Too drugs, um, which is all I've seen in my my own career, which is almost 20 years. So uh, that's to say that to to combat this issue, we do need to have credible. Uh, models for developing new therapies that can be that are scalable, and I think that's possible. So we'll revisit uh, the uh, model for how we acquire game level knowledge. So I think it's possible to create a model that can scale um, and that leverages uh, leverages advances in science and technology at every step along the way. So. At the level of gameplay, most of the things, or a lot of the things that we would be thinking about require behavior change. So there's an entire evolving science uh, of behavior change that can be applied there, along with uh, um, technological tools that are becoming increasingly sophisticated for helping us to do so. Um, and then we have other types of technologies that we would uh, use perhaps to mitigate the impact of uh, being indoors all day, so lighting solutions, uh, architectural solutions. Um, you have uh, sleep technologies from wearing sleep masks to chili pads to uh, audio to entrain certain EEG rhythms. Um, so we have all manner of potential technological solutions that can help, to, that help solve this problem and help to create, uh, provide game level interventions. Um, and then at the assessment piece, um, here we're talking about things where we're trying to figure out how we're, how we're doing uh, with the, whatever action we've taken in the game. And this is where um, source code knowledge is best applied. So disease markers can help us uh, get an idea of how well we're doing. So labs, imaging, biometrics, uh, subjective uh, data like surveys, or just talking to people, um, digital phenotyping, uh, all of these things can uh, be brought into the assessment phase. And then uh, with that data, we can apply uh, all of the emerging tools of data science, including uh, machine learning, to then figure out how to, what, what variables we should manipulate again and make, take our next action in the game and continue. So uh, creating a virtuous cycle that's uh, self-amplifying uh, and where we're, apply, where we're able to leverage the tools of science and technology at every step. So just to give a, a couple examples to help make this more concrete, so one uh, example would be the ketogenic diet, so nutritional therapies are a game level intervention. Um, 
and at that level, obviously, behavior change is a big part of uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Then you have the assessments that you'd make. You could have process-based uh, assessments, so how well someone is adhering to the intervention, uh, which can be uh, all manner of things, including measuring things like whether they're in ketosis or not. Uh, and then you have primary metrics, so the very thing that you're trying to treat, if you're trying to treat diabetes, for example, then you'd be measuring uh, hemoglobin A1C or fasting glucose as your primary metrics, and then all manner of potential secondary me metrics that you might want to care about, such as the impact on blood pressure, body fat, CRP, and so on. Um, and then in the refinement phase, you can, there are all manner of variables that you can manipulate. The uh, protocol itself, the diet, uh, the nature and frequency of their support, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and another uh, example, so um, there are all sorts of variables within sleep that you can manipulate. Um, one being trying to uh, improve slow wave sleep, uh, which uh, the research would suggest can have potentially broad ranging uh, uh, effects and could be a force multiplier on many other things um, in medicine. Um, and um, so there's all sorts of possible technologies we might develop uh, for enhancing slow wave sleep, including things already in development. Um, but here you would, uh, your, whatever your intervention is, you then assess based on uh, metrics like the time and slow wave sleep, and we already have tools for doing that uh, and tools that will likely improve in terms of their uh, fidelity. And then you have secondary sleep metrics, so anything you might want to monitor that's, uh, that's we believe might be connected to sleep or things that we don't even know yet are. And then, of course, taking that data, making a, uh, an, uh, making a uh, manipulation to the, to the variable, and then uh, starting the loop over again. And, of course, uh, uh, there are multiple domains within just, the, just sleep that you might care about. And then the uh, next frontier would be for doing this at scale, um, seeing how the, all, these every, all these different areas interact. So using the tools of uh, systems analysis to figure out what things we're doing are complementary, um, what things might be uh, uh, at odds, um, what things might be multiplicative and what, or, or subtractive. Um, it also may help us to uh, uh, resolve some paradoxical observations, so things like we know that there's pretty robust data that people who have, drink an uh, alcoholic beverage once or twice a day tend to live longer, uh, yet we know that also has uh, detrimental impacts on sleep. And we know that sleep quality is also associated with longevity, so how do we reconcile that? We currently don't um, have any real mechanisms for understanding the contextual dependencies of all of our interventions. So how does inter doing something in one context differ from doing it into another, uh, which is uh, incredibly important information. So just to summarize, the, uh, our myopic focus uh, on evolutionarily novel source code interventions explains our inability to translate advances in, in knowledge and technology into better treatments. So when you prioritize source code interventions over game level interventions, you have a spectacular failure that you repeat over and over again. And number two, that an ancestral health paradigm for chronic disease prioritizes evolutionarily familiar game level interventions. And uh, since we are all prone uh, to the, the lure of reductionism, it's useful to have safeguards uh, and a, a way of kind of uh, formalizing our approach. So that was the goal of the four quadrant model proposed. Third, that advancing knowledge about game level interventions requires different research tools and methods than source code interventions. So randomized controlled trials are not the appropriate tool for that. We need an entirely new research ecosystem for learning how to play the game. And doing so, uh, if we create that ecosystem, we can finally bring about the revolution in therapeutics that I was promised 20 years ago. And we can, in my, my cheesy success graphic, we can have exponential growth. And perhaps most importantly, um, the last point is this amazingly doesn't get old. 
Poor guy. <laughs> no. I wish. All right, that's it. Thank you. We have like two or three minutes for questions, if anybody has. Pull them up here. Josh, you spoke, I don't know when it was, but on migraines years ago, yes. and I remembered 14. I remember that presentation really well. Uh, you're a great speaker. And Thank this you. is a, a phenomenal presentation and Thank concept. You. And I think everybody needs to hear it. Great. I do too. Yeah. Uh, so, a couple of comments. Um, I did work with Dean Ornish in 2000, and an interesting thing that we did was tie, look at a variety of different potentially complementary mechanisms to see if we could get greater outcomes uh, than the individual parts alone. What you lose by doing that is certainty about what worked if it did, mm -hmm. but you could engineer better outcomes overall. And I think if one thing that we might do with lifestyle based stuff is instead of trying to have certainty, engineering for certainty, mm -hmm. gamify, okay, who can get the biggest effect? And then that'll create a different type of thinking mm -hmm. into what will go in here. Um, you, you mentioned, the, it's funny, I was writing down silver bullet <laughs> and I looked up and it said silver <laughs> bullet on the screen. I think one of the reasons why we're wanting to, it's like if we, if we can find the silver bullet, we can manipulate it and keep living the way that we do. We were, we're, right. like we're subconsciously searching for license mm -hmm. to just keep on doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, shoot, I had one more thought. <sighs> shoot, I'll forget, but I'll, I'll mention it to you afterwards. But yeah, thanks again. It sure. was great. Yeah. yeah, and I think one of you, with the first point you were saying that, um, that uh, it, once we dissociate this, the, uh, trying to acquire mechanistic knowledge from trying to understand how to play the game, yeah. you can pursue all these other types of uh, research. Um, if, if, so the, we're currently constrained by feeling like we have to prove, we have to link in the mechanism every time we, we do research. And so yeah. you can't, it, it limits us in, in many ways, including what, what you talked about. So. I, I remember my point. Oh yeah, sure. Challenging your idea. Uh -huh. Play, assess, refine. What's that? Play, assess, uh -huh. refine. Why not just play? Why not just play? Yeah, is the assess and refine simply behavioral? Like, we're, uh, if we get some validation, uh -huh. then we can get people well, to I commit mean, more so to the you play. Can, if you're, so there are certain, say, say for a diabetic or yeah. uh, someone with hypertension, you're making game level intervention, you, don't, you have to figure, you have to have some uh, assessment to, where you're, to understand whether the outcome, mm -hmm. if, if it's opaque, to the to the to the uh, patient or the client or whatever, uh, then you have need you still need measures for assessment. Some of them sometimes the feedback is right there and you can just play the game and and so much of what we do, so much of the, you know the day in and day out is required, required that way. We have our own feedback systems, but yeah. there are times when our own endogenous feedback systems aren't enough. Yeah. And let's, like I said, that's where we can deploy all of our source code knowledge yeah. to get more granular detail about how well we're playing the game. It's just interesting to me that that source code knowledge at that point might simply be behavioral because are you going to, how much are you going to change the game uh -huh. base of it? I mean, sometimes yes, but oftentimes it's yeah, just yeah, getting right. people to hear right, right. more to circadian rhythm. If alignment. you just play the game, we yeah. don't even need, right. The, the, the putting that in there, I mean, I think there's value in that. Me too. But, um, but understanding that you can, that you can create a scalable uh, concept uh, yeah. through, through a kind of virtuous cycle. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And that's time. Thank you so much. Sure.